I want to start by reading you a, a couple quotes, and I want you to tell me who the author of these quotes is. So the first quote, it is most solemnly and strictly commanded that we must be baptized or we cannot be saved. Who said that? Next one, infant baptism is pleasing to God. Number three, further we say that we are not so much concerned to know whether the person baptized believes or not, for on that account, baptism does not become invalid. In other words, it doesn't matter if you believe or not. If you get baptized, it's sufficient, even if you don't believe anything. Do you know who this is yet? Four, thus it appears what a great, excellent thing baptism is which delivers us from the jaws of the devil and makes us God's own. And then one more. For here in the sacrament, you are to receive from the lips of Christ forgiveness of sin. So there's one person that's the author of, of all of those quotes. It's not the Pope. Does anyone know who that is? Martin Luther. Now think about that for a minute. Let's open it in a word of prayer and we'll, we'll begin. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you've provided it for us. May all that we do this week glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, as you think about those quotes, maybe those were surprising to you, maybe those were not. But let me summarize a couple things uh, that Martin Luther believed. And all those quotes, by the way, those were taken from his large catechism, which he wrote in 1530. So he, he wrote that about 13 years after the events at, at Wittenberg. And the point being, it, that was his sort of considered, thoughtful reflections. It wasn't just something he did rashly and quickly. He, that those are things he really believed. When you, when you look at what Luther thought, he believed that water baptism was essential to salvation. He supported infant baptism. You're probably familiar with this. He was emphatically opposed to the concept of free will. He thought that was a heresy to teach that free will existed. He taught that you obtain forgiveness through the sacraments. That in other words, when you partake of the Lord's Supper, that's how you obtain forgiveness. He taught that as well. He taught consubstantiation. In other words, the real presence of Jesus Christ. So in other words, when, you, when the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper are present, Jesus Christ is really present as well. His body and blood were also present in that. And then I'm sure you've heard this. What did he say about the book of James? St. James' epistle is really an epistle of straw compared to the others, for it has nothing of the nature of the gospel about it. So what dispensational understanding did he have? None. Now think about that with me, if you would, just for a minute. Luther, I think this is fair, more than anyone at the time of the Protestant Reformation, he gets a hold of the concept of justification by faith. Right? I mean, he, he seizes that. He's zealous about that. He's, he's fervent about that. But when you look at, at the other things he believed at the same time, what does that tell you? Did he have a very deep understanding of it? I mean, not even close. And, it, and if Martin Luther had that, un, that amount of confusion, what does that tell you about the millions of people that came to faith during the Protestant Reformation? They, they, they suffered under the same confusion that he had. So what, what that means is this. What the Reformation produced, wonderful event, so let's, let's not make any, you know, let there be any confusion about that. Millions of people are saved. But there are millions of people that are saved and that are in total doctrinal confusion. Right? I mean, that's what those quotes mean. The scriptural term for that would be they were babes, right? Doesn't Paul talk about how he writes unto people and he has to write unto them as if they're, they're carnal, as if they're babes? So what the Protestant Reformation did, and again, it's a wonderful event. Anytime millions of people get saved, it's good. But was it complete? And the answer is it wasn't complete. So you know the verse, but what does 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4 say? Well, it says the following, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will 
And now it's going to mention two things. Who will have all men to be saved. I'm going to call that part one. And part two, to come under the knowledge of the truth. So what the Protestant Reformation did is it did a lot about part one. There were millions and millions of folks that were saved, that that came to faith in Christ as a result of the clear teaching of salvation by grace through faith. But part two, the coming to the knowledge of the truth, just really didn't happen. Think with me about Romans 16, if you would, Romans 16, 25. You know both of these verses. Now, to him that is of power to establish you. This is how you get established, how you get made stable. According to my gospel. Well, did the the Protestant Reformation get a hold of that? Well, sure, it got a hold of justification by faith. But then notice what it says. And the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. So what the Protestant Reformation did is it did part one, if you would. It got folks saved. But did they come to the knowledge of the truth? And and really not so much. Did they ever get established? Well, if you're established according to Paul's gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, by the Bible's own terms, they never became established. So what we're going to look at today is this. There, there's really two things. There's, there's more than two things, but there's two that I'm going to focus on. If you get saved, but you do not get established, here are two of the things that will happen. The first is this. You will be bound under the yoke of legalistic bondage. In other words, your life's going to be dominated by the law. And the second thing that's going to happen is this you will very likely surrender even the clear understanding of salvation itself. Now, we'll see if if I can prove those or not. But my point is this. If you get saved, but you don't get established, two things are going to happen. You're going to live under the yoke of legalistic bondage. You're going to be bound by the law. And the second thing that's going to happen is sooner or later, you know what will happen? You'll give up even the clear understanding of grace itself. And that's exactly what's happened to Protestantism. That is why the Protestant Reformation fizzled. So let's do point one. If you get saved but not established, you will be bound under the yoke of legalistic bondage. There are two basic reasons that believers will put themselves under the law. The first is math. I'll explain what that is. And the second is desire. So let's talk about math for a minute. If you don't rightly divide, then by definition, you have to wrongly divide, right? You either rightly divide or you wrongly divide. Well, we know all that. My contention is this. Most people, when they wrongly divide, what they do in practice is they just don't divide at all. Now, think about this with me, if you would. There's four basic dispensational positions, of course. There's covenant theology, there's the Acts 2 position, there's the mid-Acts position, and the Acts 28 position. And and from the standpoint of of how frequently those are believed, honestly, Acts 28 and the mid-Acts position, almost no one believes. You know that, right? Very small. So of the two big positions, covenant theology and Acts 2, let's talk about what they really do. Covenant theology and Acts 2, although they are different... When you hear people teach those positions, you know what they do? They grab verses any old place they like. Isn't that true? I mean, even an Acts 2 dispensationalist that thinks the church began in Acts 2, do they go to the Gospels all the time and quote them, completely indifferent to the fact that they're not written to them today? That's what they do. And so what happens is, The vast majority of churchianity as a whole, irrespective of whatever dispensational position they take, they really don't divide at all. They just grab verses anywhere and apply them. And that's the reality of what goes on. So think about this with me then, if you would. If we think about, let's talk about the chart here for a minute. As we think about the chart as a whole, we know that all of the Bible is for us. We can benefit from every part of it. But there's really only one section that is 
to us. Who wrote that section? Paul. Now, so think about this then, if you would. Okay. Yeah, okay, there it's there. All right. Paul's writings represent 100% of the Bible that is written specifically to us, right? So that, that part's easy. But then think with me just a little further about what that means. Paul's books are only 20% of the Bible. How many books does the Bible have? 66. Paul wrote 13. So 20% of all of the books of the Bible are written by Paul. Why does that matter? It matters for this reason. If you approach the Bible from the standpoint of you'll just take a verse any old place, in other words, if you just approach it randomly, what are the odds that as you just put your finger down in the Bible, you're going to land on something that's for you today? 80% of the time, you're going to be in a book that's not written for you today, right? But it actually gets worse. Because let's think about it by chapters. Well, the Bible has 1,189 chapters. How many did Paul wrote? Paul wrote 87. You should double-check this. I think the math is right, but, you know, who knows? So what that means is if you went by chapters and you randomly picked a chapter, what's going to happen 92-plus percent of the time? You're going to read something that is not written to you today. And, of course, what's the next thing I'm going to show you? Good idea. Verses, actually. I did words would that be too hard. Um, but look at this, because and I, and I think verses is the right one because I think this is the really the way that it happens, right? In other words, people find a verse. Have you ever had people that tell you, "Well, my life verse is such and such," and it's from Psalms? I've had that happen. Well, here's what happens: people just pick a verse they like, and so here's what happens: the Bible has thirty-one thousand one hundred one verses. This is how many Paul wrote. So what happens 93% of the time? As people just quote the Bible indiscriminately because they refuse to rightly divide, what are they doing? The sheer math of what they're doing is the focus of their attention is the law program. Isn't that right? I mean, there's no way around that. So here's what happens. If you pick a verse at random, you're very likely going to pick something That's part of the law program. If what you do, and this is a good thing to do, if you go through the Bible in a year, and it's a great thing to do that. You should do that at least twice a year. (laughs) I was hoping for... (laughs) But here's what happens. If you don't have dispensational understanding and you're an avid Bible reader and you just go through the Bible, what is your sense of the Bible going to be? Your sense of the Bible is going to be, it's a very law-based book, right? So here's what happens. If you don't intentionally, if you don't consciously rightly divide, you're going to naturally be under a law-based thinking system because that is the vast majority of the Bible. Now think about this with me. Who tells us to rightly divide the word of truth? Paul does, right? He tells us that right over here. That means there was 4,000 years of history without an explicit command to rightly divide. Does that seem odd? Well, here's why it's not a big issue. If you think about the law program, is it easy to know if you're part of Israel or not part of Israel? Do you know if you live before or after the flood? Right? My point is... Right division under the prophetic program is not that hard. You're either part of Israel or you're not, right? You either live during the 70th week or you don't. But what happens with Paul's revelation in the New Testament is that's the point in time where everyone gets confused about the gospel of the circumcision versus the gospel of the uncircumcision, right? And so what the vast majority of Christianity does is the whole New Testament is one unified thing, and you don't have to divide it because it's all the same. Well, we know from what Paul wrote that you have to intentionally and consciously rightly divide the word of truth, or otherwise your your thinking will be completely confused. 
Now, here's what I'm just getting at is this. Math always wins. It, it, it just always does, right? If what you do is you approach the Bible in a haphazard manner where you just take a verse here, take a verse there, 93% of the time you're going to end up with a, a law-based verse and you're thinking just by the sheer repetition and process of math is going to be law-based. Meaning, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, if you're not intentionally Pauline, you're going to be under the law system. And that's the reality of where the body of Christ is today, because the body of Christ as a whole has refused to rightly divide the word of truth. So the first reason believers end up under the law system is the Bible's a law-based book. That's what it is in 93% of it. And if you don't intentionally rightly divide it, you're going to just think you're under the law system. Get Galatians 4 if you would. The second reason that people go back under the law is simply this. They want to. So look with me at Galatians 4 verse 9. But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, notice what it says, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. You know why people go into the law system? It's not just the math. The math would put their mind there. But you know what it is? In their heart, you know where they want to be? They want to be under the law. Look at verse 21, Galatians 4, 21. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law. That's what your flesh wants to do. Get 2 Corinthians 11. Now, I think the following analogy is correct. The typical believer returns to the law like a battered spouse returns to the person who batters them. Now, is that an exaggeration? Look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 20. You know, with a typical battered spouse situation, what happens is the person just can't let go of it, right? And they know it's a bad relationship, but they just can't get themselves out of it. Look what 2 Corinthians 11 verse 20 says, and you tell me if this is exaggeration. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 20, for ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage. That's the exact word that Galatians 4 used about desiring again to be in bondage. Now notice what it says here. If a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, what does it say? If a man smite you on the face. Isn't that exactly how those abusive relationships work? That's the believer's relationship to the law program. You should be done with it because it's destructive. It's bondage. But what does the flesh want to do? Does the flesh sometimes want things that it shouldn't? Of course it does. And the flesh desires to be back under that law system. Get Colossians 2. Let's look at then how this actually plays out in life. Colossians chapter 2. So here's what happens when the believer goes back under the law system. Colossians 2.16. Let no man therefore judge you. So by the way, that's a command. Don't let anyone do this to you. And it says, let no man therefore judge you. Here's the reality. Churchianity is full of preachers that are happy to be your conscience, right? They're more than willing to tell you all the things you should be doing and shouldn't be doing, and they're happy to occupy that position in your life, right? That's the reality. And Colossians 2.16, what we need to do is we need to intentionally say, no, no. I'm not going to be under your judgment. By the way, there are few tyrannies worse than having to submit to the conscience of sinful men. Right? You don't want to be under that. Let no man judge you, therefore, in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days. Look at verse 18. Let no man beguile you. In other words, don't be tricked. Notice what it says. Let no man beguile of you you of your reward. They can't take away your salvation, but can they rob you of your reward by putting under the law? And the answer is yes, they can. In a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, 
Now notice this next part here. Intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. When someone wants to put you under the law system, there's a couple things that are said there. First of all, they've got a fleshly mind, because going back under the law system is, is an act of the flesh. They've got a fleshly mind. They're puffed up. They think they're something, and it's what? It's vain. So Colossians 2.18 is a complete condemnation of the, the viewpoint of going back under the law. Now, I need to do this because I, I, I just I, I love doing this, but I'm going to read you the NIV here. You ready? Now, the most you've heard this before. What the NIV is, what the modern versions are, is all they did is they took the content of the King James, and it's the same content, they just put it in new language. Right? You've, heard, you've all heard that. So... The King James says this. It says, intruding into those things which he hath not seen. I'm going to read you the NIV, and you tell me if this is the same. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. Now, is that the same thing, or is that the exact opposite? How? Ha- Isn't it just a flat-out lie to say that it's the same content? That that, that changes the meaning of the verse entirely. That's extra credit. That just came up because we're in Colossians 2, but I want you to have that. All right, (laughs) verse 19. And not holding the head. What happens is when you go back into the law system, you let go of Jesus Christ is what actually happens from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increase with the increase of God. What Colossians 2.19 says is this. When you let go of Christ, which is the source of nourishment, and go back under the law, you're going to be spiritually malnourished. That's what happens. Because the law doesn't give life, and it doesn't produce growth. The reality of this... All healthy organisms are are growing, right? Because what happens is you have some cells that are dying, and so you need to create new cells. All organisms that are healthy are continually growing. When you cut yourself off to Christ and you put yourself back under the law system, you rob yourself of the nourishment that allows you to grow. There's There's no greater way to kill someone's spiritual life than to put them under the yoke of bondage of the law. Because it doesn't give life, all that it produces is what? Guilt, condemnation. It's the exact opposite of that. Now look at verse 20. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances? Verse 21. Touch not, taste not, handle not. That right there is one of the greatest verses of fundamentalism. Right? Because what happens is, what, what, the, the different churches that exist, what happens is they all have their own different set of rules. And if you follow those set of rules, they pronounce you spiritual, right? If you wear the right colored shirt and if you wear the right things and you go to the right movies and this, that, and the other. Those are man-made rules. Look at verse 22. Which all are to perish with the using, notice, after the commandments and doctrines of men. Notice verse 23, which things have indeed a show of wisdom. It's not real wisdom. In will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Here's what man's thinking does. Man's thinking is this. If I give folks a bunch of rules and they follow those rules, that will produce righteousness in their life. And that's why they give them. But Colossians 2 says that's actually a show of wisdom. It seems like it might be that way, but that's not really how it is. What's the, what, what gives sin strength? The law. So if I were to say to you, for the next five minutes, you can think about anything you want, just don't think about pink elephants. Right? Right? What did I just, what, what just happened? You haven't spent any time in the past month thinking about pink elephants, right? But now what's going on is part of you is saying, who does he think he is telling me not to think about pink elephants? I'll think about pink elephants if I want to. 
In fact, I'm going to do that right now. <laughs> Isn't that what happens? And the reason why the, the reason why the strength of sin is the law is that the reality is our flesh nature is just so ornery. The way that you give it power is just tell it not to do something. Right? So putting yourself under the law system is putting yourself in a situation where sin dominates your life. If you wanted to quit thinking about pink elephants, what you do is you'd never say to someone, don't think about pink elephants. What you do is you try to get their attention focused on something positive. Right? In other words, get them in the Word of God, let the Word of God renew their mind. But just giving them commandments of things not to do is of no use whatsoever. So if you don't get established and walk in grace, what's going to happen is your life is going to be under the yoke of bondage of the law, and that's candidly where Protestantism is today. Now let's look at point number two. Point number two is this. If you get saved but not established, you will very likely surrender even the clear understanding of salvation itself. So let's go back to the Constitutional Convention. Benjamin Franklin is leaving the Constitutional Convention. Lady says to him, Good doctor, what do we have? Do we have a monarchy or a republic? What does Franklin say? You all know this. What does Franklin say? A republic, if you can keep it. And the if you can keep it is obviously the relevant point, isn't it? In other words, the Constitution provides for a republican form of government. But the issue is if you can keep it, meaning that Franklin understood the following. The powers that be would always be grasping more power, right? That's the lesson of modern life. Government hasn't gotten smaller, it's gotten bigger. And once it gets bigger, you know what it will want to do next? Get bigger. Because the nature of man is always to grab more power. The relevance to our what we're looking at is this. The issue with any earthly blessing is whether you can keep it. So Ephesians 1.3. You've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Can you lose those? You can't lose those. Those are guaranteed. Those are eternal. Nothing can happen. You, know, you will possess those forever. You already do. Your earthly blessings, you can lose at any time. Is there a guarantee that liberty will continue to exist in the United States? No. And let's bring it home for the believer. Is there a guarantee that you will continue to walk in what you now know? There is not. Have there been people on this podium that just depart from it and say, I'm going to do something else? I'm going to come up with my own new doctrine. That happens. People go back under the law. I don't, yeah, I'll stop there. Um, <laughs> but my point is this. The doctrinal understanding of grace that you have, you can surrender that at any point in time, is the reality. And people do that. So let's talk for a minute about problem texts and proof texts. So what do I mean by that? Let's take the following issue. Is water baptism required for salvation? And I want, I want to think through this with you about how this plays out in sort of real life. So what happens is, if I want to teach that water baptism is required for salvation, there's a bunch of verses over here that say it, right? Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, Mark 1, 4. And then, but I know, you know like, there's other verses over here that say water baptism is not required for salvation. And here's the way that the typical Protestant discussion works. If I want to say water baptism is required, I pound on these verses and I say, look here, I got three points, okay? But then the guy over here says, well, wait, wait a minute, I got three points of my own. So if I'm on this side, what I do is, these count for my points, and then I figure out how to explain these ones away, Right? So, for example, for Christ sent me not to baptize, to preach the gospel. Well, Paul wasn't a baptizer. He was an evangelist, and so that verse doesn't really prove your point. So now what happens is I have three, and he has two, right? And if you're on this side, you do the same thing. You follow me? In other words, what, the way that people approach Bible study is 
Here are the proof texts that prove my position. Here are the problem texts. These are the ones that sort of disprove my position. So what I need to do is if I can figure out a way to explain these, then he has no points and I have all the points and I win. And that's what the typical Protestant discussion is. In other words, there are verses in my column, there's verses in the other column. I try to minimize these and maximize those. That is utter madness. Because what that's doing is it's saying, yeah, yeah, these are verses in the Word of God, but I'm trying to explain them away. What right division does is it makes both sets of verses prove your point. Right? Does, are there verses in the Scriptures that teach water baptism, water baptism is required for salvation? Yes! And they're written to these folks here. Right? Right division allows all of the verses to be true and you don't have to explain them away. It's the honest way to read the Word of God since God obviously didn't make any errors. But here's the problem. We talked earlier about the fact that Protestantism has failed to rightly divide. So what happens is the answer to this question is right division. This is probably true for, for many of you. Did many of you have a point in time where you were looking at the New Testament and you thought it says this here, it says this here, and I don't know what to do with this, right? Because they seem to say different things. I know the Bible doesn't have errors. I mean, what am I supposed to do? And then what happened? Maybe for you. Someone draws the chart and you're like, wow, that burden just got lifted off my shoulders. Because God himself has divided his word in a way that I can believe all of it. But if you never come to that understanding, then you'll spend the rest of your life explaining away part of the Bible. And that is what Protestantism is doing. Let me, uh, so, so think about this with me then if you would. We looked at the earlier numbers chart. What percent of the Bible is law keeping by verse? 93%, right? So if you try to argue the grace position, you have an uphill battle if you don't rightly divide, don't you? Are they going to have more verses than you? They are. And that's, that's a problem for the position of grace if you don't rightly divide. Let me give you another example. Let's talk about spiritual gifts. And before we get to the verses, just think through this with me if you would. Look, there's no gift of healing today. Can God heal people? Well, sure, God can heal people. But is there a gift of healing? No, there's not. And there's, simple, there's a simple way you know that. Healers hold medium meetings in auditoriums, not hospitals. Right? I mean, just common sense tells you there is no gift of healing today. Right? If you had the gift of healing, just go to a hospital and prove it. Right? Common sense tells you there is no gift of tongues today. Because what Pentecostals do is they study to learn foreign languages, right? I mean, you, you guys had high school Spanish or French or something. Would you prefer four years of high school Spanish, or would you prefer, look, I'm just going to babble, and that guy will understand. I mean, wouldn't it be so much easier if the gift of tongues actually existed? But it doesn't. And common sense tells you that. The, the, the third one, you know this one as well. Mark 16 talks about people having the ability to handle serpents. Right? And what happens every five years or so, people forget the recent news, and they try it, and they realize that verse doesn't work for me. Right? Now, my point is this. Just from a common sense standpoint, common sense is not our authority, but just from a common sense standpoint, you know that the gifts have ceased. Because those things aren't happening. But here's the problem. So get 1 Corinthians 14. 
1 Corinthians 14, verse 39. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophecy, and notice what it says, and forbid not to speak with tongues. So if you're the Pentecostal, and there's all these arguments, well, these folks claim tongues don't exist, this, that, and the other. They can go right to 1 Corinthians 14, 39 and say, well, look, the act of forbidding to speak in tongues is itself wrong. You claim to be Pauline. But Paul said, don't forbid speaking in tongues. So here's what's happened. And I want to quote what J.C. O'Hare said on this matter. So here's a lengthy quote, but it's, it's worth hearing. It does seem that God is using the rod of Pentecostal fanaticism to bring to their senses the grace preachers among fundamentalists who teach that the dispensation of the mystery began with Peter on a Jewish feast day instead of with Saul after his name was changed to Paul. So Harris says what God is using today, he's using the rod, you know, the chastening of Pentecostal fanaticism. The, there are some grace preachers that say it started right here with Peter. And if you say it started right here with Peter, what you've done is then you're all in for Peter's program being for today is, is what you're signing up for. O'Hara continues, They will say that there was no difference between the gospel of the circumcision committed to Peter and the gospel of the uncircumcision committed to Paul. That's exactly where fundamentalism is today. They add to the confusion by teaching that Paul perpetuated the, the same message and spiritual program with, which began with Peter and Pente at Pentecost. The answer to Pentecostalism, Seventh-day Adventism, Anglo-Israelism, and every ill and ism with which the body of Christ is afflicted is Pauline grace truth, the understanding of Ephesians 3, 1 to 11 and 4, 1 to 14. So here's what O'Hare is saying. All the excesses that you see today in Pentecostalism and British Israelism and all the rest, the answer is, Rightly dividing the word of truth. If you allow Paul's ministry to be separate, as Scripture says it is, then you have an answer to this. But here's what happened. Fundamentalism as a whole said, no, 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 we refuse that. Peter and Paul have the same ministry. And by the way, you know what that allowed them to do? It allowed them to keep the Great Commission. There were some things they wanted to hold on to. They wanted to hold on to water baptism, right? Because if you're Pauline, you realize there's no place for it today. They wanted to hold on to water baptism, and they wanted to hold on to the Great Commission. And so as a result of that, they said, okay, no, no, Peter and Paul have the same ministry. Guess what? You just signed up for everything in the kingdom gospels, right? You just signed up for all of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You signed up for the law program. You signed up for handling serpents. Give me an honest intellectual explanation of why you shouldn't handle serpents if Peter's gospel is the same as Paul's. You can't! And that is where we are today. Look with me at... at uh, well, get Mark 16, 17. Mark 16, 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe... In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. Now, when you think about Mark 16, so just think about where it is. Mark 16 is right here. It's right after the cross. That's exactly where Matthew 28 is. So the fundamentalist that, that signs up for Matthew 28, Mark 16 is the exact same time period to the exact same people. There's no honest intellectual way to get rid of it. So you signed up for the whole thing. The Pentecostal has a better argument than the Acts 2 dispensationalist. That's the reality of it. Now, there's a couple of verses that everyone knows today. The first is, and this is, this is true, one of the most popular verses today is, use a little wine for thy stomach's sake. Right? I mean, you can talk to people who have no biblical understanding whatsoever. Somewhere they've learned that verse. I'm dead serious. I mean, haven't you found that to be the case? The other thing everyone knows is the book of James, right? So get James 2 with me if you would. James chapter 2. Listen, what ought to be the case today 
is everyone that's old enough to speak has Ephesians 2, 8, 9 committed to memory, right? And they should all be able to quote 1 Corinthians 15 as to what Paul describes as the gospel. But you know what happens? Here's the verses people really know. They know they'll use a little wine, and they know James 2. So look at James 2, verse 17. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Verse 24. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. And here's what happens. You've, you've had this experience if you've told the gospel to someone. What they will say, if you preach salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, they will say right back to you, faith without works is dead. They may not know it's in James, but they'll quote that verse right back to you. They do it all the time. Now think about what Martin Luther said. Luther says... James is an epistle of straw. Now listen, Martin Luther is a great guy, okay? So I don't want you to misunderstand anything I'm saying. But that is a totally inadequate response, right? I mean, is James part of the Word of God? Yes. Was it inspired? Was it preserved? Is it something God wants available to his people? Yes. And it is, it is a completely inadequate response to say it's an epistle of straw. It's there. It's there for a reason. And so here's what happens. Fundamentalism as a whole has no intelligent response to someone that says faith without works is dead. There is no intelligent response to that. And so what happens is when you teach them Ephesians 2, 8, 9, their flesh already wants to go under the performance system of the law. The math of the Bible wants to go back under the performance system of the law, and the only answer that fundamentalism has is some totally inadequate explanation about how James is an epistle of straw. Or it's the other thing they say today, well, it's justification before men. As if any person should be concerned about being justified before men. That's the attitude of a Pharisee. That's the problem the Protestant Reformation had. If you don't rightly divide the word of truth, then there's no reason you shouldn't live under the law program. Now, I started point two by saying this. I said, if you don't get established, if you don't learn how to rightly divide, you will likely surrender even the clear understanding of the gospel itself. Well, here's what, here's what happens. This is a, a quote from 2010, so it's a little bit old. Just 19% of Protestants knew the basic tenet that salvation is through faith alone, not actions as well. Rewind to Martin Luther. Luther is emphatic about justification by faith, right? He, he, he's, he's staunch on that, and he knows that to be true, but he can't understand James. So he responds by saying it's an epistle of straw. And he doesn't have clarity on water baptism. All those quotes were from him. He thought it was pleasing to baptize infants that had no faith and that somehow helped save them. Utter madness. Right? So what happens is, for Luther, he got a hold of justification by faith, so he wasn't going to leave it, but... All of his followers and those that came after him, is there a principled reason to believe justification by faith in light of Luther's catechism and in light of what the whole of Scripture says? See, 93% of the evidence is against you. Do you see my point? Listen, if you don't get established, if you don't learn how to rightly divide, that book will mess up your life. Not because it's any fault with God's book. <laughs> the fault is with our understanding. And that's where Protestantism, it, Protestantism is today. So let me close. That doesn't mean I'm quitting soon, but I'm just shifting where I'm going. <laughs> let me ask you this question. What is it that you have to do to leave grace? And the answer is not a thing. Listen, if all you, it, here's the way it works. If you don't intentionally stand for grace, if you don't stand fast in the liberty, if you don't make a choice to do that, 
you'll end up under the law program and it won't take any effort whatsoever. The sheer math of the Bible will take you there and your flesh's desire to be under the law will take you there. Here's what happens. This is sad to think about, but here's the reality. Of the folks in this room, you know what's going to happen? Some of you are going to leave grace and go back under the law. That's the reality. And it's not going to take any effort to do it. It'll be easy. Because the world system will take you there. Your flesh will want to go there anyway. That's what will happen. And my encouragement to you would be this. Make the conscious decision not to. Make the decision to continue to stand in grace truth. Look at me at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So, as I think about Ephesians 2, 8, 9, I'm tempted to think the, the most important part of that verse, of those two verses, is the last part of it. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works. And then what's the last part? Lest any man should boast. You know that the root of all of our problems, it's pride, is what it is. And we're overconfident, and we think we're doing well, and, and that's just one step from disaster. What we need to do is we need to be vigilant about the truth. The reality is this. So as you think about why the Protestant Reformation fizzled, as you think about what we need to be doing today, if you do part one, if you get people saved, but you never bring them into the knowledge of the truth, you know what you've done? You've brought them part way along, but they're just going to slide back down is what's going to happen. They're just going to end right back up under the law. What you have to do is you have to bring them onward to maturity. You have to bring them to the knowledge of the truth that they understand right division, that they understand who they are in Christ. And that's why what we're doing is so important. I mean, here's the reality. You know what people look, think of when they think of this meeting? Well, look, look how few of you there are. You're not even in a real church building, right? You're probably some sort of cult, right? And I've talked to some of you. You're sort of weird, <laughs> right? And the world just views us as a bunch of insignificant weirdos. It, it just be completely honest about it. The fact of the matter, though, is this. If you don't stand for these things, if you don't get established in them and continue in them, your life is just going to be under the bondage of the law, and it'll be confusion. Colossians 3.10, we'll close with this. And have put on the new man, notice, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. What we need to do brothers and sisters, is we need to continue on in grace truth. We need to daily renew our minds. We need to continue to stand for right division because that's the only thing that's going to get people established. There, there's nothing else that will. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you you've preserved it. We have it. It's without error. It's flawless. It is the sure and safe guide to our lives. May we handle it in a way that will always please you. And it's in the name of your son that we pray. Amen.